good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight, I'm going to pick up where we left off, it seems like, a couple of years ago. In reality, it was just a couple, three months ago from the book of Jeremiah. So we'll be turning to Jeremiah chapter 7 this evening. We're going to be covering chapters 7 through chapter 10 of Jeremiah. We will not get through this, of course, tonight. We will continue this next week. However, keep in mind this is a survey and we will not be going through every single verse, verse by verse. In Jeremiah chapter 1, that gives us the call of Jeremiah. The call of Jeremiah into what was called a prophetic ministry. The Lord called Jeremiah into this. The Lord also told Jeremiah that he was going to have a tough time. He said, Jeremiah, this is what I want you to do. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have a tough ministry. I wonder sometimes how many people today would say, yes, Lord, I'll go ahead and do it. If the Lord says, hey, it's not going to be easy. And we find this really came true throughout the book of Jeremiah. Along the way in Jeremiah, we see uh, some behind-the-scenes glimpses into what's going on in Jeremiah's heart. And we're told that during these 40 years of prophecy, that Jeremiah started his ministry during the reign of good King Josiah. Now, in the Old Testament, you had good kings, you had bad kings. Once again, Josiah, he was a good king. The word of the Lord, the Bible tells us in, in Jeremiah chapter 7, the, Lord of the, the word of the Lord was found in the temple and brought to Josiah. The result of that was something of a revival that was led by Josiah. Josiah called the people to repentance and to turn back to God. Josiah renovated the temple and led the people in the return of worship of the Lord. However, instead of revival, it might better be called reformation. What we have here is people outwardly returning to the Lord, but on the inside, their hearts were still attached to their idols. In other words, for the most part, it was not genuine. It was not sincere, but they did return to the house of the Lord. At this time, they were so proud of their house. They were so proud of their church. It was renovated. It was refurbished. And it looked so good. People literally were coming in huge numbers to the house of the Lord to worship. I remember, Josiah was a good king. But then a guy named Zedekiah, he came along. He said, what happened to Josiah. Josiah lost his life in a tragic battle. He made a poor decision militarily and lost his life as a result of that. Now we have Zedekiah. We say bad king Zedekiah. And he led the people back into idolatry. Oh yes, they were still going to the house of the Lord. They were going through the outward motions of church attendance. Oh, and people say that the Bible is not relevant today. How that applies to us today. The people were going through the outward motions of church attendance, but in their hearts, they were still attached to their idols. One thing we say so often in teaching, especially in the Old Testament, whenever you are looking at an Old Testament passage, it's always a good question. To ask yourself, how does that apply today? Same thing here. People were going to the church in Jeremiah's day, just going through the motions. And you know, even today, sometimes we get the idea that, that because people go to church, that they are genuine. They are sincere in their worship of the Lord. But that is not always the case. I think we understand that. Also, a big crowd is not necessarily a guarantee that the Lord is blessing. Oh, I'm not against big crowds. 
We are having our outdoor service here this coming Sunday morning, and I, I trust that we will have a big crowd, a lot of people praising the Lord. But just because you have a big crowd does not mean that the Lord is blessing. You see, it's not necessarily the big crowds, but the question is, is it real in our hearts? Is it genuine? Is it pleasing unto the Lord? The children of God here in Jeremiah at this time used the going to the house of the Lord as a good luck charm. They felt like nothing bad could happen to them because of this magnificent house of the Lord and the fact that they were going there. Today, hey, I am going to church, and because I'm going to church, everything's going to be okay. That's not always necessarily right. You see, sometimes if you're not careful, you can trust it's in the house of the Lord rather than the Lord of the house. And so the Lord calls Jeremiah to do something very unusual here. He says, Jeremiah, I want you to go over to the house of the Lord. Jeremiah, I want you to go over to the church and preach. The Lord said to Jeremiah in verse 2, he said, stand at the gate of the Lord's house. Now, get the picture. Here, the people are going in and out of the Lord's house. They're going in and out of church. God has said to Jeremiah once again, go at the gate where the people are coming in and proclaim there this word. Imagine yourself going into the church or coming out, and all of a sudden, you hear a voice. Someone says, hold it! Stop right there! It's like they all began to look, and what they saw was a young prophet named Jeremiah. So Jeremiah began to preach a sermon, we could say today, basically on the church steps. We see, first of all, and this is the only point we'll probably look at tonight, he looks at their worship. He examines their worship. Now, once again, we're just going to hit the highlights here and there in, in this passage. But Jeremiah examines their worship. He goes beneath the surface of their worship. He starts off with an appeal in verse 3. He says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways. Correct your ways. Clean up your act. The way you live. The things you do. The Lord says, so I can make my home with you in this place. In other words, he said, get real, folks. Ooh, then he points out the lying words of what is going on in the worship service. He says in verse 4, he said, Trust not in lying words. Many seem to think he's talking about the choir anthem here. It may be a picture of the temple choir. Not temple, Free Will Baptist Church, but the temple choir at that time. But notice the repetition here in verse 4. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord are these. Jeremiah here is ringing the changes on the lies that were going on in the house of the Lord. And you know, no matter what we say in the house of the Lord, when we sing, if this is talking about the choir, when we sing the songs that we sing, do we pay attention to the words? Do we really mean them? Are you singing to the Lord when you sing those songs? Are you singing from your heart? In verse 9, he points, on, points out what's going on in the lives of the people. Here they are going to church on Sunday. They're going to church on the Lord's Day. And yet, verse 9, he says, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not? Here he mentions five out of the ten commandments that they've broken. Now, one of the things about the prophets is that the prophets always did not beat around the bush. They always called sin, sin. Now, we all know today, basically, we want to call sin by different names. We want to call stealing embezzlement. We want to call lying exaggerating. We want to call adultery an affair. We want to call gossip a prayer request. But the prophets called it exactly what God calls. He says in verse 11, Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? 
This is quoted again by Jesus in Mark chapter 11 and verse 17 where he said, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. You find the same thing in Luke chapter 19 and 40, for, verse 46. Also in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 13. The house of God is to be a house of prayer. Yes, we have preaching. Yes, we have Singing, good singing. Our song should be about Jesus. Our song should be about the blood of Jesus. Jesus shedding his blood, dying on the cross for our sins. Our messages should be the same way. Jeremiah here is saying, listen folks, you have turned the house of the Lord into a hiding place. You think you can hide in God's house. You think you can hide from the Lord in his own house. Oh, we see it going on today in many churches. Any church that ignores the holiness of God and makes it easy for people to live in sin and never be confronted by their sin, that church becomes a den where people can hide out. The house of the Lord should be a place of forgiveness. The house of the Lord should be a place of cleansing. But it also should be a place where we are called to come face to face with the holiness of God and the sins in our lives so that we might be brought to repentance and turn from our sin. So Jeremiah is examining their worship. Look at verse 16. It's one of those, what? What's going on? It's one of those kind of moments. Because the Lord said to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 16, Therefore pray not for this people, or don't pray for these people. Neither lift up the, uh, crying or prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee, or I'm not going to hear you. I'm not going to hear them. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, don't even pray for them. Oh, you know, what's going on here? Samuel said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing or by not praying for you. And we're taught to pray for one another. But there can come a time when judgment is on the way and God says you don't need to pray for them anymore. Yes, prayer delays judgment. Preaching hastens judgment. The judgment was on the way. See, this false worship that they had was also creating problems in their families. Look at chapter 7 and beginning with verse 17. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. That was Ishtar, the goddess of fertility for the Babylonians. What this is telling us here that even the families were involved in false worship. In chapter 7 and verse 21, for instance, he talks about the sacrifices that they were making there. I mean, even their sacrifices had become sin because he says in verse 23, but this thing commanded I them saying, obey my voice. The Lord saying, obey my voice through Jeremiah. Verse 23 says, but they hearken, excuse me, verse 24 says, but they hearken not. The last part of verse 24 says, and they went backward, not forward. The Bible tells us to obey is better than sacrifice. It's not enough just to go through the rituals. It's not enough just to go through the motions of worship if it does not genuinely express the attitude and the surrender and the obedience of our hearts. Verse 31 says, And they have built the high places of Topeth. Topeth just simply means fireplace, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. In that day... In the valley of Hinnom, there was Topeth, this fireplace, which was a bronze metal statue of the god Molech. They had a fireplace in that statue, and they would take their own sons and daughters and throw them into the red-hot arms of that statue of Molech as a sacrifice. I'm sure you can hear the cries and the screams of the little children there in the valley of Hinnom. That was such a bad thing that ultimately one of the reforming kings later stopped it. 
and turn that place into a garbage dump so that by the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Valley of Hinnom was a garbage dump of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus called it Gehenna. He used it as an illustration of the place, the eternal garbage dump of the universe, hell, where people go who reject the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Well, that's worship examined by Jeremiah. Next week, we will continue on this and look at not only the worship, but the wickedness that was seen in these people. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see what Jeremiah is telling us today, that yes, we need to go to church. Yes, we need to trust in the Lord. But make sure that we're not just going through the motions when we come into your house today. And Lord, just guide us. Help us, dear Lord, to be not only the believer you would have us to be, help us to be the witness for you that we need to be. Thank you for loving us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you once again for your faithfulness, for your prayers, for your encouragement. Thank you for your faithfulness and your tithes and your offerings. Now, this coming Sunday morning at 1030, the weather looks like it's going to be fine. At 1030, out in the field beside the church, we are going to have our outdoor service. You'll bring your own chairs. That would be great. If you don't have any or if you forget them, we have some here we can help out with. We're going to be asking you to, to stay together as families. We're going to try and our best uh, to, to help with the social distance. We're going to try and make it as easy as possible. Also, if you do not feel comfortable yet in getting out and getting into uh, or close to a group of people, we still will be doing our service online via Facebook, or YouTube as well. So please uh, keep this in mind as well. We don't want anyone to feel like you're forced to come because we're doing our best to make arrangements for anyone and everyone. You say, when are we going to end up having services on the inside of the church? We will let you know. It's still going to be a few weeks off, but we're doing all we can uh, to make it as uh, easy a transition as we possibly can. Once again, we love you. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you so much for your encouragement. And Lord willing, we will see you excited and ready to worship the Lord this coming Sunday morning in our field here at Temple Free Will Baptist Church. We love you. God bless you.